Right, hello and welcome everybody. Um, as John mentioned, yes, my background is in horses and in particular in the grazing behaviour of horses. We have a business called Equiculture. I was brought up very near here in Bradford and we then spent, uh, once, once I'd done the MSc, we then went to live in Australia for 25 years. My husband's over in Australia at the moment doing talks in Sydney. Um, and then we came to live back here about six years ago. So, but we still, we're doing talks between here and Australia still. So a lot to get through tonight. I'm going to talk quite quickly, but our website does have a lot of information on it, a lot of free information where you can go to and find out more. So feel free to have a look at that afterwards. I'll put the website up at the end. So rewilding with horses. Sorry, I'll just try and get rid of this little bar at the... Um, Okay, I'm not sure how to get rid of that. Okay, so why, why are horse owners so important in terms of rewilding? So when we're talking about rewilding, um, often people think of these big rewilding projects, which they're really great. We've done talks down at NEP, the one down in um, Surrey, I think it is. Uh, fantastic project and, you know, those kind of things where they use horses, that horses are vital to those rewilding projects. But what a lot of horse owners don't realise is that they are in a unique position to make a huge difference collective, because they are collectively responsible for a huge amount of land. And they can carry out many of the recommendations that are given to farmers without affecting production. In fact, actually making really positive changes for their horses while making positive changes for the environment at the same time. And all that takes is just knowing how to do that and things can be turned around very, very rapidly. So... Uh, but first of all, managing horses, um, managing land and horses means understanding their grazing characteristics because there's quite a few things about horses that makes them very different from other grazing animals. So horses are often assumed to be just like cows, which are ruminants, where horses are not ruminants. But other than eating grass plants, they don't have much else in common. Horses are actually what are termed hind gut fermenters. So their digestive system actually looks very similar to ours. It's just that the proportions are different. But most of their digestion goes on after the stomach in the hind gut, which is very different to that of a cow. So they digest or ferment their food, mainly in the large intestine, and they rely on billions of bacteria to help them. And it takes a lot of time to do this. So they digest their food on the hoof while they're still grazing. So they don't lie down and ruminate like rum ruminant animals do. They digest as they're grazing night and day. Horses are not actually as efficient per mouthful as cows when they're grazing. They have to actually eat more food. But what they do is they spend more time on that food, uh, digesting it. So that the, end, the end result is the same, that they still end up with enough nutrition. But um, the, the, the um, strategy that horses have, which is actually in some ways is superior to that of cattle, is that in, in very hard times, they can actually increase their throughput um, if they need to do. Whereas with cows, they literally run out of time. Um, so the more fibrous and, and less nutrition the, nutritionist the food becomes, the more cattle struggle with that. Whereas horses just keep going, keep increasing their throughput so that in the end they can be surviving on just leaves and twigs. Um, and that will get them through most times until that drought or winter period breaks. So they're very good at doing that. And their nearest cousins are actually the tapir and the rhino, which are also hind gut fermenters. So the reason I'm mentioning that is so that you can see that they're not related to cattle at all. They're a very, very different animal because after these animals, the rhino and tapir, the next animals along to them are um, elephants and then even pigs and then later on humans are more closely related to horses than cattle are. So they're a very different animal. Horses have... Um, Horses have um, very sharp pair of front teeth. They're like a pair of scissors in the mouth. And so that the horses can eat extremely short grass, but that doesn't mean that they should be eating short grass, as I'll be talking about in a minute. And ironically, people often put horses on short grass thinking that it will make them lose weight. But all that actually does up to a point is actually they can actually increase their weight on short grass because per mouthful that very short grass is actually very high in sugar and horses have the perfect equipment to eat that very short grass so we need to keep that in mind so they're very different to a cow that has to rely on its tongue to graze and only has one set of incisors so it's so there's quite again that's one of the big differences as well 
So we need to understand a few horse grazing characteristics and grazing behaviours. So horses have certain peculiarities that affect the land. One of them is their dunging behaviour. So when horses are left to their own devices, you'll see this kind of thing happening. And by that, what I mean is when land is set stocked with just horses, you will see this, this marked area of roughs and lawns. So the roughs are where they drop their dung and the lawns are where they graze. And only horse, horses do this, cows don't do this and sheep don't do this. Um, and the problem is it ends up being where you might start out with say a five, five acres of grazing, but over a reasonably short period, over two or three years, you'll end up where about it can be about 60% of that land is unavailable to the horses. So you do need to do something about this. And I'll be I'll be mentioning that a little bit more as we go through. So you end up with this this um, imbalance of nutrients where they're dropping their dung, but they won't graze, and where they're take where they're grazing, but they're taking the nutrients from that area and dropping it in the other area. So, as I said, the lawns end up um, overgrazed. And this is actually a natural behaviour. It's also seen in free living horses, but in free living situation, it doesn't become so apparent because many factors reduce the effect. So, for instance, in a free living situation, you would never have just horses. You would always have other grazing animals at the same time, which is where if you manage land in a domestic situation, if possible, it's much better to have different classes of animals all grazing the same area of land, whether that's at the same time or one after the other. So land in this condition, as I said, it's got an imbalance of nutrients um, and unhealthy plants. And, these, and this land is often termed as horse sick. It doesn't mean the land is actually sick, although it's not very healthy, to be honest. It's a very old fashioned term, but it means that, and, but the land will also have a high level of parasitic worms, as well as well-established roofs and lawns. And a lot can be done to reduce or even eliminate this behaviour, resulting in much even more even grazing and reduced parasites and better use of the pasture, which I'll go into a little bit more later on. So although they're predominantly grazers, horses, equines are also browsers and foragers. So they supplement their diet with many plants, including bushes, trees, herbs, berries and succulents. And they eat a very high fibre, low energy diet. So they can, as I said before, this picture is taken in the new forest, but they can survive on, on land, on grasses that are higher in fibre than what cattle can, especially domestic cattle. And But horses actually need access to food on an almost continuous basis because they actually, unlike us, where acid is released into our stomach as we eat a meal, and it's the same with a dog, with horses, that acid is constantly being dripped into the stomach. And if they don't have access to fiber, that acid builds up and creates stomach ulcers. So the way that a lot of modern horses are kept where they're fed on meals and kept in stables, they're also very susceptible to stomach ulcers. So horses are very selective grazing. As they're grazing, the top lip is used to sift and sort and choose different plant materials. And this means that without good management, again, some plants will be overgrazed where other plants are ignored. Again, this picture is taken in the new forest, but um, their diet is naturally very biodiverse. So over a yearly period, so throughout, over the day, they eat many different plants, but also seasonally and over a yearly basis, they eat a huge variety of plants if they have the opportunity. So just going to quickly look at some of the differences between wild living horses and domestic horses, because it's good. We need to understand those differences, but also to understand the similarities. So in the free living situation, horses uh, live in herds and, and have to be on the alert much of the time, but they take it in turns to be alert. That's one of the big advantages of living in a herd. They travel large distances daily from where the feed is to where the water is and back again in what's known as the home range. Now, this is something that's peculiar to equine. So um, other large grazing herbivores tend to migrate across the continent. So think about wildebeest and how they go from one side of the country to the other and then back again over the whole year. Horses don't actually do that. They actually live in what's called a home range. And this is interesting because this is actually an advantage to us when it comes to keeping them domestically because their home range contains all of the resources that they need, such as their feed, water, shade and shelter. And all they have to do is travel between those resources um, in order to be um, content. So this is a picture of um, taken of Brumbies in Australia, just showing how they're always returning back to the same areas rather than migrating. Um, 
But this means that when conditions become very harsh, they have to manage with what they can find within their home range because they don't overlap into other groups' home ranges. So they, they, you know, once they have a set home range, that's it. So they have to live on what they can find in that. Whereas animals that migrate are always moving with the grasses, so they're always eating the grasses or aiming to eat the grasses when they're in peak condition. Horses don't do that. They stay in one place and they eat those same plants even though they have, you know, biodiversity in that area, they're eating them throughout the season. So it's quite a different strategy. So in an area with plentiful resources, the home range is relatively small. So again, this is a new forest ponies. Um, it might only be a few square kilometers or miles, um, but that's okay because within that area is everything that they need. Whereas in a, in condition, these are brumbies in in America, um, they might there, and certainly in Australia, where um, where horses live. Sorry, that's brumbies in Australia. It's mustangs in America. Um, the brumbies in Australia, their their home ranges are several. You know, it can be thousands of square miles. They're absolutely huge because they have to travel those distances to get what they need. So free living horses can cope with a variety of climates ranging from very cold to very hot. The only temperature they don't, the only climate they don't do well in is is very um uh, humid weather which actually ironically can happen in the uk and as we get more climate change happening um that's going to happen more often because horses um just like humans which in as far as i know they're the only animals in the world that do this rely on sweating to keep cool most other animals have other strategies for cooling down um, and the trouble with sweating is it doesn't work very well in in a highly humid climate um, so horses manage to keep warm in very cold weather because when you have a high fibre diet, um, that fiber gives off heat as it's digesting. So the fact that they eat a lot of fiber helps to keep them warm in really cold climates. Yeah. So um, coping with temperature extremes uses up a lot of that stored energy body fat. So horses are always aiming to put lots of weight on through the summer so that when it comes to harsh times such as winter, then they can use up that stored um, body fat. And that's what happens in the natural situation. They get fat through the summer, but they always lose it in the winter or in a drought situation. They lose a significant amount of, of weight. And this is a natural cycle for free living horses to gain weight when feed is, feed is plentiful, but to lose it when food is scarce. And this is what we this is a really important point, And this is something that we need to be learning how to do with our domestic horses. And I'll try and make, get back to mention that a bit more later. But again, if you keep in touch with us, this is one of the things we're going to quite a lot. This picture here is interesting because it shows two Dartmoor ponies at exactly the same time of year. One is in the um, Dartmoor Pony Centre. The other is a free living Dartmoor Pony. And just look at the difference in those two ponies. But also look at the pony on the right has access to lots of grass. And look at the condition of her is actually really good. The pony on the left, look at the grass that that pony's on. Sorry, I've got to take a drink now. And look at the fat lumps that are covering that pony. So that's the difference in lifestyle. And what we need to be doing as horse owners is trying to move more towards replicating what the wild pony is living living conditions are like rather than that captive pony and it is possible to do that in the domestic situation when you know how so in the wild mares produce a foal most years so this is dartmoor ponies again in fact they have a foal about two out of every three years on average and this uses up vast amounts of energy because they can be feeding a foal and pregnant at the same time Stallions work hard to keep their band of mares together and to service mares during the, the breeding season. So again, using up lots of energy. Colts using lots of energy, playing and learning how to be stallions. But and the, and all of the herd take part in an active, uh, you know, take part in daily herd life. So there's always something going on. It's very active lifestyle, completely different to that of domestic horses. Therefore, free living horses have a low energy diet for much of the year. And at the same time, they're constantly moving. They're on the alert, coping with a range of temperatures, dealing with shortages of feed and reproducing. And they've never, they're never wormed, have their hooves trimmed, have their teeth attended to or a rug. So they have all these different stresses that, that helps to maintain their condition. So they're using vast amounts of energy on a daily basis, a complete contrast to domestic horses. 
So humans manage domestic horses for better or for worse, and they have completely different stresses to their more natural living counterparts. They're often receiving too little exercise and too much high energy feed, rather than lots of low energy, high fiber feed. They may have um, just only, they may only have available to graze, to graze badly managed overgrazed horse sick land, if that's all that's available. And this, there's nothing to graze, and this is a really important point. A horse will stand around once they've run off any surplus energy. So a lot of horse owners turn their horses out for the day thinking that the horse, well, there might not be much grass in there or whatever, or it's quite muddy because it's been raining for the last week, but at least he's going to get some exercise. But what actually happens is you turn a horse out on grass that's not biodiverse, not good grazing, and all that horse will do once they've run out, had a quick run around, is stand at the gate waiting to be let back in, making the gateway even more bare soil and muddy and creating all these problems. So understanding that this is happening makes you realise that you can actually turn that around. And again, I'll go very quickly into that a little bit later on. Also means if you don't look after them, you've got to buy more feed, resulting in higher feed bills. So domestic horses have no input into how they're managed. They must be wherever you put them at any given time of the day. They have absolutely no say in what happens to them. And this is a big deal when you think about how having choice is a significant factor in mental health for people and animals. So the more that we can move away from that, the better. So therefore, domestic horses tend to have a high energy diet because of peer pressure in particular, you know, we, we, we're led to think that horses need all these you know, extra extra feed and so on. And at the same time, they're usually not moving enough. They have to cope with a range of temperatures. They don't have to be on the alert. And they're not usually reproducing, which is a good thing, as there are already far too many unwanted horses. But basically, the modern domestic horse is a couch potato compared to their ancestors and wild living relatives. Modern horses are suffering from the same problems as modern humans and pets, age and obesity related health issues, eating more junk food, high sugar feeds, rarely getting enough exercise. But domestic horses still retain all of their natural characteristics and this is why they thrive as feral animals. So many animals such as these in this picture, which we looked at a little bit earlier, which are um, horses in the Americas, they're all um, released or escaped domestic horses. They're not, wild, they're not actually wild horses, they're feral animals. And they actually do exceptionally well. Even in Australia, where the conditions are even harsher, horses do incredibly well as feral animals. So it just goes to show how, even though they are domestic horses, they can cope uh, perfectly fine unless there's a drought situation such as in Australia that goes on for too long and then they do tend to suffer eventually but then any animal would in that situation but horses still retain all of their natural characteristics and behaviors even when as a domestic animal and again this is why we should be looking to keep them that in a way that's in line more with um, you know, acknowledging those domestic behaviors Horses are meant to be outside and grazing, moving and socialising whenever possible. And a grazing horse is a moving horse. When horses are grazing, they're also moving. The right sort of grazing, and basically that's biodiverse pasture, creates movement. Because if, if you've ever noticed, when you turn horses out onto a new fresh paddock, they move a lot. And that's because they're looking for those different grass plants. They like to have as much variety in their diet as possible. So they keep walking to find those different plants. And again, this works to our advantage when it comes to managing the land. Whereas the more overgrazed the land becomes, the, more, the less the horses move. So we need to keep that in mind. So are horses good for the land or not? Horses are often blamed as being bad for the land or inefficient as grazers, especially by farmers, when in fact they're very efficient when allowed to be. It's the way that they're mismanaged that's the problem, not horses themselves. And this is why horses are now being used on, on some of these extensive rewilding projects because um, they are you know, obviously quite perfect at what they do, uh, absolutely brilliant at what they do. They wouldn't have survived to where they are now if they weren't. So alongside other large grazing herbivores, particularly um, cows, 
then that combination works particularly well for recreating biodiverse grassland. So that's really exciting. And for us, after living in 20, for 25 years in Australia, to come back and find that this was happening was really exciting to us because we'd gone away, left England all those years ago, you know, with the same mindset, thinking that, you know, horses particularly, weren't particularly good for the land. But then spending the next 20 odd years educating people in Australia about how to manage land, but not realising what was going on over here with all these rewilding projects until we came back about six or seven years ago. So it's very exciting. And um, so how should we manage land for horses? A common problem that most people have is that they don't have enough land. And this is wherever you go. There's, there's such a shortage of land. And the smaller area of land that's available, the more intensive a management system will be required. So, for instance, if you have three horses and five acres, your horses cannot live wild and free. It's just not going to happen. Because if you do that, if your horses are out 24-7 um, and you never bring them in when it's really dry or when it's really wet or do anything, then over time that land will degrade unless it is absolutely perfect land and, and it doesn't really exist, that sort of land. It's always either too wet or too dry. But once you understand horses grazing characteristics and behaviours and once you, once you understand land and so on, it is perfectly possible, even when you have too many horses for the amount of land you have, to improve it out of sight and in a way that will actually help the horses and when they go out they will have more quality grazing they will be improving the land rather than degrading the land and you'll be on an upward spiral and all it all it takes is a little bit of knowledge so basically you've got a very fine balancing act going on because at any given time of the year you'll either have too much grass or too little the land will either be too wet or too dry and your horses will either be gaining weight or losing weight. So it stands to reason that doing the same thing every day, i.e. turning the horses out, is not going to work. Even if you have enough land, unless the, because if those horses have weight management issues, then you know, you've, you've got to manage them at certain times of the year. And you need to remember that adverse conditions are always just around the corner. So you should aim to keep your horses as sustainably as possible. Otherwise, you may run out of feed, money, time or etc. in the future. You need to be prepared for the inevitable, but very dry and very wet times each year. And this is whatever country you live in. There's is not even that much difference between here and Australia in those terms. Australia tends to be more dry than wet, but when it's wet, it's incredibly wet. Here tends to be more wet than dry. However, how, as we're finding with this last summer in particular, we're now starting to get droughts here in the UK. So we're all facing those same problems and we have to manage that. But you can maximise the efficiency of what you have. And so at certain times of the year, horses will need to be removed from the pasture for their own sake or the land's sake. Now I'm saying this, if you have, if you had... Uh, one or 200 acres and only three or four horses and you also had cattle and so on, you might not have to remove them, but hardly anybody is in that situation. So you will need to remove your, you will need to remove that grazing pressure and grazing pressure is the combination of what they do with their teeth and what they do with the hooves, even just standing around on the land. You have to remove that grazing pressure. Otherwise you're going to get more and more land degradation and your land will be on a downward spiral. So all horse keeping is about, all domestic horse keeping is about compromise. Because unless, as I said, unless you've got thousands of acres at your disposal, you can't keep horses in a natural way. But the real skill lies with understanding the natural processes and making informed compromises while mimicking what happens in nature as closely as possible. You need to think of yourself as a grass farmer. So even though you don't want the same grasses for your horses that a cattle or sheep farmer does, the way that all grasses survive and thrive is the same. They all need periods of being grazed and periods of being rested. As a grass farmer, you look after the health of the soil so that it can produce healthy pasture because that is the key. Short stressed grass plants are higher in sugar per mouthful than longer grass plants and horses have just the right equipment to eat very short grass. So putting fat horses or ponies on very short pasture doesn't necessarily reduce their energy intake. In fact, it can actually increase it. Stressed overgrazed grass plants can be high in sugar as they hang on to sugar in preparation for improved conditions. So they store the sugar at the base of the plant. So by keeping the grass plants short, you're actually aiding in that uh, process. 
they also force the heat so diet paddocks where we you know we talk about that in horse keeping quite a bit well we've, i've got a diet paddock they don't really work and they can be a welfare issue and they create, create land degradation. So by a welfare issue, what I mean is they're actually forcing the horse to eat plants they wouldn't otherwise. Because, so horses will actually sometimes eat weeds or even poisonous plants that they wouldn't normally eat. And unless manure is managed very well, the horse ends up eating nearer to manure piles. And it's the manure piles, which is where the worms are. And naturally, the horse is, you know, innately is telling himself he shouldn't be eating near there. But if the horse is starving and he needs more food, he needs more fibre, he will eat nearer manure piles than he's comfortable doing so. So deliberate overgrazing causes problems for the future. And unfortunately, pasture must be at a stage where the land is suffering if it's being deliberately overgrazed to control a problematic horse's weight. This is not sustainable land management and land in this condition is on a downward spiral. So that's where grazing systems come in. To manage land well, you need to learn about grazing systems. The most important one is rotational grazing because this creates healthier pasture. It allows the plants to rest, recuperate, set seeds and multiply. So remember, overgrazing now means that in the future, your horses will have less healthy pasture and therefore less movement. And you in turn will have, to, will have more expenses and will have to work harder in the future to feed them. Eventually, you may get to the stage where every single mouthful of feed they eat will need to be bought in feed, whereas it doesn't have to be like that at all once you understand grazing systems. So grazing, rotational grazing is the main grazing system that you need to learn about. And the reason it works so well is because it, it's the, mo the, most, the way of most closely copying what happens to pasture in the wild, where animals move across the landscape, grazing, dropping manure and trampling as they go. Um, that's what happens in the wild situation. They then move on and leave the area to rest and recuperate before another herd of grazing animals, usually a different species, come along and graze the plants. So the horses with the rotational grazing system, the horses are allowed to graze the plants when they've reached a certain height and they moved on to the next paddock when the plants have been grazed down to a certain height. And after impl implementing rotational grazing, other grazing systems can then be added to that to find true tune grazing management. Um, so such as strip grazing, which a lot of horses already use, but they do tend to overgraze the area on the graze side of the fence, where you should still be moving the fence on before the grass gets too short. You still need to take care of the land. And cross on mixed grazing, because again, that is copying what happens in the wild because in the wild, no, no area is only grazed by one type of animal. Um, so when you've got different animals grazing the land, um, it's in a much healthier condition. But it has many pluses, including worm and weed management. One of the big advantages of horses being so unrelated to other ruminant animals is that there's not really any crossover in their worms, their parasitic worms. So when the wrong animal picks up those worms when they're grazing that area, they actually kill out each other's worms. So it's one of the ways of reducing worms in grazing animals is to have cross grazing going on. So that's a big benefit. So benefits of, of having an area that's shared between ruminants and non-ruminants is, as I said, in the wild, land's always grazed by a variety of species. And as I've already said, they, already, they also reduce each of the parasitic worm, worm populations. Other species um, reduce the negative effects of equine dunging behaviour because cows will eat, will eat round horse manure and vice versa. They will each eat near, other, each, near each other's piles of manure because innately they know that they don't have to worry about the worms in those areas. So you'll get much more even grazing going on. So what's interesting is that even though you may already have too many animals on your land, Introducing a couple of sheep or a cow, a couple of cows or whatever might not necessarily result in in there being too much more overgrazing, but it still would and it would definitely be better to do that than have a couple more horses because you will actually get much more even grazing going on over the land that you have. Dung beetles work just as well in horse manure as they do in ruminant manure. And if you don't know about dung beetles, you really, really need to do because they are absolutely incredible and we've got a video on that a free video on that on the website make sure you watch that they are so exciting um 
And also another advantage is that they select to some extent different plants. So they might graze some of the same grass plants, but they also have plants that only horses will graze. And then there's plants that only cows will graze and so on. So again, the combined effect is more of even grazing um, and much better um, utilization of the paddock. Limited grazing is where a surface holding or loafing area is used to reduce the grazing pressure as and when necessary. And those this set up, once it's set up, it'll become a lifesaver for you and your horses in the environment. So this means you can get your horses out of the mud and onto hard standing at any time when the land is too wet or too dry, which it always will be at some time of the year. People, you may have heard the term alternative grazing systems. Um, so, and one of them that you might have heard of is what we invented about 25 years ago called the Equicentral system, which, um, which we now teach worldwide. And basically, in a nutshell, that is about using an area of hard standing where the horses can always get themselves back to it. Uh, the gates to the paddock are never closed. They can always bring themselves back to that um, hard standing. Um, and that vastly reduces the grazing pressure on the land. But that's it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's just it in, um, in a nutshell. But basically it creates a mini home range for your horses. So the, any extra feed and all the water and any hay that they're getting are back on the hard standing and they bring themselves to that area. And you would be absolutely flabbergasted at how much of a difference that makes to your land. So instead of them standing for hours and hours and hours in a paddock, waiting to be let back in, they let themselves back in basically. And so they only go out to graze and they bring themselves back in. And that means that the upshot of that is that there's a lot more quality available grazing. When they do go out, it's for more quality grazing sessions. So having hard standing is really important. It, it's essential for good land management, especially when you consider that hardly every, anyone has enough grazing for their horses. So it's an in, in, integral component of our central system, but just for any horse property, you need somewhere to re remove that hoof pressure. So unless you have a large area of land, as I said, you'll need that hard standing. This is just some examples of different mud mats now are becoming very, very popular. It doesn't have to be too elaborate. So the beauty of mud mats is that if you rent the land and then you move on, you can take them with you. Um, this, this is mud mats and then covered up with gravel and so on. So there's all sorts of things you can do. There's numerous ways that hard standing can help you to manage your land. And as you can see in this picture, these horses are voluntarily and quite happily standing on the hard standing. And yet the gates open and they have access to long grass. So very quickly, five easy ways to start to rewild your land. One, let your horses graze, let, you know, let the pasture plants grow taller. Taller plants provide a habitat for beneficial insects, small uh, mammals, reptiles, everything. Taller pasture plants create more biodiversity because a wider variety of plants get to grow, set seed and multiply. Taller plants means longer, thicker root systems, meaning that more healthy nutrients are brought up from deeper layers in the soil. Taller plants have longer, thicker root systems, which sequester more carbon than short plants, much more and more quickly than trees. And this function is improved when the plants are repeatedly grazed and then allowed to regrow as part of a rotational grazing system. It's effectively pumping carbon into the soil. Very exciting stuff. Longer, thicker roots um, equal better soil protection, less or no mud or dust. So plants can then be grazed in wetter conditions for longer to a point. Taller plants keep the soil warmer in cool, cold weather and keep the soil hot in, keep the soil cooler in um, dry conditions. So they reduce evaporation. They have so many benefits. It's just, it's just untrue. So make, make sure you have a look. There's two um, articles on our website in particular that you need to have a look at. Short grass or long grass, grass for horses, which is best. In that, I go into all the issues of horses that are too fat, and so on, because that's a big issue for horse people is they're worried about grazing the horses on more grass. When you understand how to do it, most horses can be transitioned onto taller grass. So there's a second article as well called switching horses to grazing taller grass plants. So make sure you have a look at them. Second thing you can do is fence off, um, fence off between horse paddocks and, and plant hedgerows, but I'll fence off corners in horse paddocks. Corners are unproductive spaces that are also dangerous. When horses get galloping around the square paddock, they can easily gallop into a corner. Horses are much more active than uh, cows are. 
And as we all know, horses can really get moving when they when they want to do. All you have to do is put a simple electric fence across the corner, plant it out with bushes and trees. You've made that you've made that area safer. You've made it so the horses will now turn rather than gallop into the corner. And you've created wild, one for wildlife at the same time. It becomes a haven for wildlife and increases biodiversity. So that's just one example of one of the really simple things you can do to completely turn things around. By providing habitat for wildlife, so birds and insect-eating bats, you're also helping to control pest insects on your land. And those, for instance, bats eat many thousands of insects on a daily basis. And those insects are actually going to become more problematic as climate change goes on. We're going to get more mosquitoes and so on. So this is really important that we provide habitat for them. Hedgerows um, increase wildlife corridors, making it easier for wildlife to move around the land. So um, they also create essential windbreaks. They also need, they should usually need to be fenced on both sides because horses can push through them. But this can be a simple electric fence. It depends on, on the hedge itself and so on, at least initially to get those plants happening. Double fenced paddocks are much safer for horses. Horses should never be allowed to interact over a fence as it shows you in this small picture here. That is one of the most unsafe things horses can do is play with each other over a fence. Horses should be in together, not with a fence between them because horse, fences kill many, many horses on a yearly basis, um, if not severely maim them or whatever. We should prevent pollutants from running off the land where horses graze. So plant a fence off waterways and only allow control if any access. Best practice is to have a water source elsewhere, such as in a surfaced loafing yard, rather than have it, having horses get getting to it on a daily basis. Taller plants that will then grow around that waterway will provide, provide various functions. So it provide habitat for wildlife. They'll filter out nutrients and reduce the amount of manure and fertilizer getting into the waterway, which will then lead to less or no algae blooms occurring. So it's really important to have that vegetation growing up around a waterway. But if the animals always have access to it, that waterway, that those plants will never get a chance to get going. Those plants will hold the soil together on the banks so that lesser or none of it gets washed away. This all results in cleaner, healthier water and all the benefits that go with that. And fencing off a waterway has got, yeah, sorry, I've just said that. Um, leaf fallen branches in safe areas, if where it's safe to do so. So if you've got woodland areas on your land, you can make sure you leave fallen branches on the ground where you can. Um, find out if bird boxes would be a good idea in your area. Learn when the correct time of year is for trimming hedges so that you don't disturb nesting birds. Think about planting areas that are not much good for grazing anyway, such on steep hillsides. Plant those, you can plant those out with different types of plants. They could even be what we call fodder plants, plant, plants where the horses sometimes have access for grazing, but not all of the time. But these areas can then be left to nature or, as I said, grazed only occasionally. It depends what, what sort of plants they are. Um, there's also many other ways to increase biodiversity on a horse property. You can grow herb gardens where the horses can have occasional supervised access, um, that sort of thing. So it's all about getting the balance right. I'm just winding down now, last couple of slides. It's all about getting these three sets of factors in balance. We've got the human factors, such as what it costs to do all this, such as the budget and so on. The equine factors, such as their behaviour and welfare, and the environmental factors. They have to be in balance in order for it to work. Usually this is the case because historically that's how things have developed. So um, that's what's usually going on. Whereas if we get them, as I said, if we get them in balance, then the whole system starts to work better. We start to get all these benefits um, that we won't see when things are out of balance. So just as an example, if, if even if the human factors are out of whack, if it costs too much to do something, it's not sustainable. So everything has to work. We have to keep everything in balance. Um, I'm just going to really quickly mention a couple of things about horses when they're used, when you're using them as, for rewilding projects. This, these, some of these issues are the same, whether they're on pet horses or whether they're on larger rewilding projects or whatever. What we need to remember is that horses live a long time. Um, they develop age-related disorders that are not seen in farm animals simply because they live so long. Very old horses are unnaturally old. So in the wild, they wouldn't usually survive much beyond 25 if that. 
they'd be picked out by a predator. But even if there are no predators in the area, once their teeth are no longer functional, then that's the end of the horse. Whereas in the domestic situation, they can be kept going much longer than that. The record for a pony is 55 years old and the record for a horse was 51 years old. He died um, just a few years ago in the south of England. That was the record age for a horse. So things we do need to keep in mind, the laminitis, poor teeth, obesity, so that if you, so if you don't have experience of keeping horses, these are all the sort of things you need to be learning about. Horses can survive in very harsh conditions with low quality food in winter, but they must have access to shade and shelter because in the wild, they would always have that. They would always be able to get themselves to shade and shelter. They wouldn't be fastened in a paddock where they couldn't move around and get out of the weather if they need to. So yes, horses don't necessarily need to be rugged or whatever, but they do need to be able to get to shade and shelter. You need to think if you have groups of if you're keeping horses in herds, just um, you need to think about natural grouping. One male to a number of females works well. Otherwise, all female or all male groups it doesn't tend to work if you have a lot of males and only one or two females. That's an unnatural group. So you'll tend to get more fighting going on. But there are exceptions and you shouldn't be keeping horses on their own. And that's not good for land management either, as well as welfare issues. Also think about the welfare of other animals when kept with horses. Horses can be very rough on sheep and on calves, not so much on adult cows, but they can be very, they can, they can kick calves and so on. But that does tend to be young, very exuberant horses. Older horses tend to be much more placid. Okay, so I've managed to wind that down just bang on time. Very pleased with myself there. Our website is equiculture.net. Please do go on the website. Um, there's lots of information on there. We have a free course which covers um, a lot of what I've talked about tonight and more. Um, and obviously then you can take that at your own speed because I've rushed through a lot of things tonight. Um, you can take it a bit more slowly. But please keep in touch. Uh, we're very interested in this whole subject. And um, yeah, you can come along on the journey with us. Thank you for listening. Jane, thank you very much indeed. What a what a brilliant, I nearly said canter then, but sorry, I didn't do it anyway. That was involuntary, but I'll take it. Um, great illustration of the um, the benefits of balance in the system for the well-being mm -hmm. of the horses and the land. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a few questions in. Jane, would you mind switching your video in on so people can see you as yeah. well? We've heard you all the way through and that's been yeah. nice um, to see you now. How do I do that now? You're just oh. on the bottom bar next to the mute button. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, do, you're on. Thank did you. Did I stop my screen share? Um, no, you can leave your website up there, I think, for uh, people to refer to. So yeah. as I say, we've got a, a decent number of questions. There's room for people to put more in um, if they wish to. Um, you mentioned a bit about uh, sort of amounts of land needed and practicalities and so on. Often where people have just got small holdings, is, is sharing of horses a, a, a possibility? And what are the practicalities needed around that? Do you mean if a couple of neighbours shared horses between them or something? Well, it could be that, or it could be, can I borrow one for a, a month or two to browse down a, a long pasture? Absolutely. There's no reason why not, as long as everybody that's involved understands about those horses, knows a little about them. Because with horses, the biggest issues are managing their weight, because as I didn't go into in much detail there, but whereas with cows and sheep, they don't usually live into middle age because they're usually processed or whatever. By the time they start to get all those middle aged issues, horses are kept through that period. And so it gets to the stage where managing their weight is very problematic. So if you were sharing them, the people you were sharing them with would have to be equally knowledgeable. And as, but as long as they were, then absolutely not. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. There's no problem with that at all. Everybody would have to be on board about how to manage their weight. But as long as they are, then yes. Thank you. And another aspect of that, I guess, is sort of use as wormers and other treatments. You talked about, you know, how they'll avoid parasites and cross species and things. But um, is the use of worms quite prevalent? And can that be an issue when the hero dung beetles then suffer? Well, what's happening in the horse industry, there's now pressure, even with vets and so on now, to reduce worming, chemical worming, because, you know, everybody's starting to realise how dangerous they, well, how, how dangerous they are, but how they're actually becoming 
um, you know, they're not they're not going to work anymore um, if we carry on using them at the level we're using them. So um, what horse owners need to be learning about and what we help, you know, we do teach about is dung beetles, cross grazing. They're the main two um, uh, weapons against parasitic uh, worms. Once people understand that, rotational grazing is another one. Once people understand all these things we're talking about, worms are really not a problem. With people who follow our methods find that they might only end up having to worm once or twice a year. And what they always tend to do is test the horses' fecal worm egg counts before they worm, which is the best practice anyway. So, and, and I think more, more and more farmers are going to get into doing that kind of thing as well. In Australia, interestingly, they're, they're predicting that because dung beetles have been so um, so successful over there, that in, certainly for farmers, because the dung beetles are absolutely incredible at reducing worm burdens in all grazing animals. Once you understand how they work, well, and again, that's what happens in the natural system. So it's just about um, keeping, you know, copying what happens in nature. That's what we need to do. So did that answer the question? It did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I sort of hesitate on the next one it, it is about ragwort. Is it is it a problem or not? That's a really, really loaded question because there are people who believe it is and there are people who believe it isn't. We have somebody in our group who's an advocate for ragwort. I, I don't know which where, where I stand on that one, but I do know that when horses are on overgrazed land, they will eat plants that they would not dream of touching otherwise. And when you go to Nep Castle, for instance, I don't know if you know about the Nep project, that yeah, yeah, there's ragwort everywhere and their ponies are grazing in amongst the ragwort and they're absolutely fine, but that's because they have all that biodiversity available to them. So, I think in many ways, this worry about rag work comes from usually we're focusing on the wrong thing. You know, we should be thinking more about providing more biodiversity for our horses. Whereas, in fact, it's if, if you overgraze the pasture, then yes, the horses are going to eat things that they shouldn't be eating and wouldn't dream of eating in the wild situation. Um, it can be an issue in hay. But again, one of the other things we talk about is, is grazing standing hay in the winter. It doesn't work for everybody, but that's that can be a, prob a possibility as well. But it's a really tricky with the jury's still out with ragwort because there are people who are absolutely are convinced that it's terrible, and there are others that are not. And I've heard both ends, and I had no idea. But I, I think your point about if there's other stuff available in a more natural system, it's less likely to be an issue. Yeah, and it's supposed to be so good for wildlife. You know, it's it's mm. for the pollinators and so on. And I know at net they don't worry about it at all. <clears throat> at least I don't think they do. Last one on sort of uh, potentially moving horses between different owners, different places. From what you said about home ranges, is that likely to upset them that we might not think about or do they kind of mm. get used to it after a short period? Interesting. I mean, the thing is for domestic horses, they actually spend their lives being moved around. Not many domestic horses are lucky enough to actually live in the same place their whole life. Mm. So yeah, in, but what's more important, I would have said, is that they're with their herd mates. So yes, it might upset them a little bit in that they've got to now find the new places to graze and shelter and so on. But the fact they can do that in a herd is better than what what happens with many horses is where they're grazing and then one day somebody comes and catches them that then unbeknown to them they've been sold and then they you know they're off in a truck to another part of the country and never see them again and i'm not saying you know we shouldn't do that i've done it myself millions of times i'm just saying that's what happens to horses when you, the more you think about it the more you think wow that is actually a huge thing and that is far more upsetting to them i would say than being moved as a herd Okay, thank you. Um, what about particular breeds of horse? We often on rewilding projects now. You hear about conics or exmoors and things. Yeah. Is eighty nine percent of the benefit coming from any horse, or do those particular native breeds really make a more of a difference to the environment? Well, I would I would say that we should be looking to the the British native breeds definitely, and that down south generally, exmoor ponies are absolutely the way to go. And I would say up here in the north we should be looking to think like fell ponies because they're equally in danger um as a domestic horses 
on, as a whole, are definitely not in danger. We've got way, way too many of them already. But there are specific breeds, such as Fells and Exmoors, which are, which are, you know, about could become extinct, whatever. And they, so they, if you were starting a proper rewilding project, definitely we should be looking to those kind of breeds. On the other hand, if somebody already has horses on their own land and just they don't ride them anymore or whatever, and whatever for whatever reason they want to, you know, increase the biodiversity on their land, absolutely use the horses you've got. Absolutely, don't breed any more because there's plenty of them. But if you're starting a project from scratch, look at those British domestic breeds. I know in those some of those pictures it showed you some of the conics and they were from down in Norfolk, but. From what I've gathered, that's you know that sort of all happened many many years ago when they first start. That was when the first rewilding projects down on Wickham Fen, and they you know they weren't necessarily thinking along those lines of using British native breeds. I'm sure if they'd started again because they got quite a bit of flack for that, they would start with Exmoors. But you know they're too far down the line now. They've got that herd well established. But yeah, definitely, I, I would want to know more about fell ponies in this region. That's natural to this area. Thanks, Jane. A uh, couple more, and then uh, we'll move towards wrapping up. Um, whether natural regeneration or planted trees, would horses tend to browse off young trees, or would they? Does it depend again what else is around? What was that with regen with trees that have been planted? Well, either a natural regeneration of trees and shrubs or planted trees. Do they need guarding from horses, or would the horses tend to leave them? They do. They would when they if you plant little seedlings or whatever. You know, like they would need protection because horses will literally pull them out by the roots and not even eat them, but they'll certainly taste them. Mm. So they need fencing off. But usually, once they get up to a certain stage then they would be okay. And again, it just depends on how much pressure there is, you know, how much, how many horses there are, how overgrazed the land is. I mean, people put a lot of, um, put a lot of money into really good fancy fencing for horses, for instance, when in fact, they don't go anywhere near the fences if they've got good grazing. The reason they hang out and hang over the fences is because there's not enough grass to eat. And most of the time, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, literally. So that's why they put a lot of pressure on the fences. And it's the same with trees and so on. If they, if the balance is right, then those plants, you know, will be just fine. But if there's a lot of pressure, then the horses are going to be eating those plants when they might not do otherwise. But most of the time, any if you're planting trees and so on, they're going to need protection at least until they get above head height or whatever. Thank you. Two to go. Um, one from Jan Stannard of Heal Rewild and a great friend of ours. Um, Heal are considering keeping a small female only herd with a few cattle and a few pigs on each of their rewilding sites. What are the benefits or disadvantages of a female only herd long term? That would be fine. And, and you would, without any trouble at some point, be able to introduce just say one gelding to them if you wanted to, but you don't have to either. Because in the wild, a natural family herd is one stallion or sometimes two, one might be a younger one. Um, but the rest will be seven or eight females. So that's how they're used to living. Just the same, an all-male herd is fine as well because they have bachelor groups, so that's fine too. But, but it just doesn't work when you've got a lot of males and females because be, the males will be fighting over the females, that, even when they're gelded, you know, yeah. which they are. So all females is absolutely fine, yeah. Thank you. And the last one, apologies to anyone who's just putting late ones in now, but time is getting away from us. Um, what research has been done on the effects of, I don't know if it's ergo or ergot fungus, which infects standing hay on horses? Now, that can be a problem. Um, and again, it's possibly going to be more of a problem with um, global warming as we get as we get more humidity. So I'm not I'm not I can't actually point you towards any actual research at the moment, but I'm sure there will be something out there if you want to do a search for that. Um, some people say that once the hay is dried off properly, it can still be grazed. But again, you need to be looking into that. That, um, but yeah, sorry, I can't actually help with that one. I must admit, I don't actually know of any studies at the moment of that, but I'm sure they will be. And we do just a real quick word. Yeah, we do need to be aware that things are going to start changing more with global with climate change. We're going to get more insects. We're going to get more, yeah, things like that happening. We're going to get quite a few 
um, things changing as the climate changes, which we're going to have to be prepared for. Jane, that is phenomenal encyclopedic knowledge and the amount you've covered in that hour is wonderful. Um, <laughs> got lots of comments in the chat about how much people have enjoyed that. Um, yeah. how fascinating it is and really great slant. People asking for more information, which I think will all be on your website or people. Yeah, who know, information on our website. Just, yeah, just get on our website, on our mailing list and you'll be kept up to date. There's one lovely comment in the chat saying thank you and that uh, an uncle, a dairy farmer, always said horses were bad for the land. I wish you <laughs> heard your talk, they say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, people have really enjoyed that. Thank you. Good. Thank um, you. I've got a, a task for the audience now, if I can make the tech work properly. Because of the particular um, uh, subject of this webinar, we reached out to a lot of other organisations beyond the Yorkshire Rewilding Network. And I'm just going to see if I can run a poll to ask you to just show... Um, if you can tell us how you heard about this evening's webinar, we send out emails from the Yorkshire Rewilding Network. We send out tweets. We have a forum where we post on it and a LinkedIn group. Um, or you might have heard about it from elsewhere. So um, if you could just let us know, that would be great. Um, doesn't surprise me that the YRN email is, is the, the highest so far, but that's in the 70%. I'll uh, let it run just a few more seconds. Um, while we do that, I'll just mention that our next webinar will be on Tuesday, the 20th of December, will be about um, a specific rewilding project, which is the Kingsdale Head project up past Ingleton. Um, it's high up in the Dales, um, really interesting project from Moreland uh, downwards, and Jamie McEwen from there is going to tell us about the work that they've been doing on that. So the details for registration to that are on the website. Um, I'll stop the poll now. Uh, nearly all participated, thank you. And the results that came through, just to uh, let you know, were that three quarters through my emails, but also very uh, welcome to the person who heard from another organisation. Um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing on, on that. Um, final thing I would say, as ever, is to uh, ask people if you've enjoyed that. We do rely on donations to keep the network running. Um, we've making some progress with our Wild 100 Club, where we ask people to donate £100 a year uh, to support our work for those that can, which enables us to keep this and similar events free for those that can't. So um, do join others that have uh, joined Wild 100 if you can. Otherwise, if you're from a different group and would like uh, to have Jane talk, uh, deliver this talk to you, she has said she's interested in spreading the word further, which is great. And um, I'm sure you can get in touch with her through the website whose address is on there. At which point, thank you ever so much again, Jane. That's been really comprehensive and interesting and um, a slant I'd never thought of other than kind of seeing horses as part of the mix. So thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We hope to uh, hear from you soon and uh, see you at the next webinar. Bye for Bye. now.